It is Wednesday, September 7th, and we're here together as the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. And we'll be in Genesis chapter 17 in just a few moments, so I want to invite you to be turning there to Genesis chapter 17, and I'll meet you there in just, uh, just a moment. Uh, but we're glad that you've joined us tonight. We would invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day for a Bible study at 9.30 and for the worship assembly at 10.30. And if you have any questions about what you see or hear in class tonight, uh, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would love to hear from you. As we get started tonight, I want to let you know about something going on over in Jefferson this weekend, the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival. I can't believe I'm announcing this. But as some of you know, I have attended this event several times um, uh, over the last couple of years since taking on the role of shepherd. I think primarily to learn something about sheep. Uh, the Bible says quite a bit about sheep, and so I, I know... Uh, I have wrangled sheep in the past on one occasion. I know I've told you about that a time or two before down in uh, near Evansville, out in the country, kind of uh, outside of Janesville somewhere. And that was an interesting experience. And I grew up seeing sheep at the McHenry County Fair down in um, Illinois. But for the most part, sheep have been something of a mystery, <laughs> not just to me, but I think to most of us in this society, in this culture, in this part of the country, especially in a big city that we're in right now. But in our society, we're a little bit disconnected from the way sheep behave and, and that kind of thing and their behavior and how they're raised and the work that goes into it. We may eat a euro here and there, <laughs> but that is about it, or maybe a wool sweater or a wool shirt from time to time. But the Bible, though, of course, contains many references to sheep and to shepherds, and so there is a great value in learning and to finding out something about how sheep behave and some of the work involved in uh, bringing them up. Well, the main highlight for me over the past couple of years has been seeing the Crook and Whistle Nationals, and that is a competition among shepherds where they go out in the field and they use their trained dogs to maneuver sheep around fences and obstacles and complete a number of other challenges just absolutely amazing and then toward the end of that competition as i remember it they have to uh, isolate one particular sheep like the largest of the group or whatever and get that one off to the side and they do that using their dog and the whistle and the uh, shepherd staff that they have but a, a very interesting competition over there at the jefferson county fairgrounds uh, another highlight has been visiting the lamb barn where they usually have several lambs that are just a few hours old. I think it might be through some kind of UW program with uh, veterinary science or something like that, where they help out with that. And they normally have a number of lambs just uh, born a few hours previously. And if you time it just right, you can also catch a sheep shearing demonstration. And that is absolutely fascinating and something I had never seen in person until just a few years ago, until I saw it over there. Um, I am, and I think that's at 10 o'clock this uh, coming Saturday. There's several offerings. That's the one I'm hoping to make it to. I don't know if I will. I've got a lot going on the next few days, but I'm kind of shooting for 10 o'clock Saturday morning, if possible, to uh, be able to see some sheep being sheared and then uh, look at the competition out on the fields there. And then they also have two yarn barns. Oh, I don't know. I kind of walk quickly through those, but uh, it was fascinating. And then they also had several food trucks. So food is good. They had a small kitchen there offering lamb brats. And they sold out right before I walked up to the counter a couple years ago. So maybe again this year. I may give that another, another shot. Uh, but I'm just saying that since sheep play such a prominent role in the Bible, you may want to consider this. If not this year, then perhaps at some point in the future. But if you think you might make it over there this weekend, let me know. I, I may be interested in meeting up with you if you're interested uh, in doing that yourself. Well, tonight we're back in the book of Genesis. So the book of beginnings written by Moses, the prophet. Uh, we've been looking at a man by the name of Abram over the past month and a half or so in this book. And Abram is chosen by God. He's told to leave his home to travel to an unknown land, which he does. And over the past several chapters, God has made some promises and he has renewed those promises a few times that Abram will have many descendants, that they will inherit the land, and that his descendants will be a blessing to the whole world. Over the past few weeks, we've also seen Abram try to, I think we might say, uh, help God out a little bit by coming up with some workarounds, and that does not always work too well, does it, when we try to find a way around God's plan. 
And so the promise doesn't look like it's going to be fulfilled. Abram is trying to find some way to get it done with some disastrous consequences. And in tonight's chapter, God will re renew his promise to Abram yet again. So we're going to pick up tonight and jump right into it by looking together at Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. So this is the first paragraph in tonight's class. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Most of this is simply God repeating his previous promises, and we might wonder why this is necessary. Why does God keep on doing this over the past several chapters here? But that's probably why Moses, the author here, notes Abram's age. So I hope we notice how much time has gone by. Up in verse 1, Abram is described as being 99 years old at this point. You might remember from the end of Genesis 16 in last week's class that Abram was 86 years old at the birth of Ishmael. And you guys know I'm not good with math, but I believe this means that 13 years have passed. So Abram is now 13 years older than he was when Ishmael was born. Plus, we don't have a record of God communicating with Abram during this time. God might have spoken to him, we just don't have a record of it, but as far as we know at least, this is it. 13 years have passed. So Ishmael is born, 13 years would go on, and now we kind of jump back into it with this passage out of the blue. So God renews the promises. Abram will have many descendants, he will be exceedingly fruitful, kings will come from him. I believe this might be new information. I don't know if we had that before. And his descendants will also be given the land of Canaan. That's another one of those promises that we've already seen. So this is a, a reminder or a renewal of the covenant. Well, the new information we have in this paragraph is that God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Finally, it is about time. I don't remember... Uh, this going on for so long when I've studied the book of Genesis before, I didn't realize that he was called Abram for so many chapters. And that's been a challenge for me not to say Abraham every time we look at this word. And I might have slipped up a time or two. I can remember at least once. Um, but now we can finally refer to Abram as Abraham. And that's kind of a relief to me going forward. One less uh, a way to mess this up. But the name Abram means exalted father. But the name Abraham means father of many or father of a multitude. So I think we see where this is going, don't we? God renews the promises. And then in changing Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude, God is now indicating that something is getting ready to change. In the same way, if one of my kids ever starts calling me grandpa, I think that would indicate to me that something has changed or is about to change. I hope that makes sense. And in a similar way, God changes Abram's name to Abraham. So from exalted father to father of many or father of multitudes. And we do have several name changes in the Bible, don't we? This, I believe, is one of the first, if not the first. Uh, but we have other name changes throughout the Bible. Jesus, for example, changes Simon's name doesn't he? To Rock or uh, Cephas or Peter. Uh, and it, it comes at the same time as a major life change in Peter's life. And I think we would say the same thing uh, takes place here. Um, by the way, did you know that God never changed Saul's name to Paul? 
from Saul, the persecutor of the church, to Paul, the apostle. I, I kind of might have taught that in the past, that God changed his name from Saul to Paul. Uh, but upon further review, uh, I no longer think that this is what happened. Instead, it seems as if Saul actually had two names probably all along. Saul seems to be used when he's dealing with a Jewish audience primarily, and Paul seems to be used when he is dealing with a Gentile crowd. And you may want to check me on this and, you know, fact check your preacher here tonight and let me know if you discover something different, if I have missed God changing his name from Saul to Paul. But in Acts 13 verse 9, Luke, the author of that account says, but Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then on from there spoke to a certain uh, magi a magician, I believe, in Paphos on the island of Cyprus. But that's just another uh, quick note that uh, we see a name change in the Bible, certain people in the Bible come to mind. But I'm just saying, as I'm, as I'm brainstorming, I, I kind of think Saul to Paul, um, but that is really not the way that went down. Um, one other thing, let's not miss this either. Let's imagine Abram returning to his people and saying, well, you guys can now call me Abraham, the father of a multitude. Okay, can you picture that? Here's this guy, 99 years old. <laughs> and I can imagine some people perhaps laughing at that. This 99-year-old young man, he's got one 13-year-old son, and now he suddenly wants to be known as the father of a multitude. This guy has lost his mind. We need to keep an eye on that guy. He's not well. And I'm thinking that could have been a source of uh, humor, maybe for someone in his family or concern at the least. But God changes his name from Abram to Abraham, father of a multitude. And uh, speaking of new names, let's not miss that God calls himself by a new name in verse 1. I think this is the first time that God describes himself as God Almighty. I believe that's the first reference to God Almighty or El Shaddai in the scriptures. So that emphasizes that God is mighty, that God is able to keep his promises. And of course, he uses this new name for himself uh, going into this renewal of the covenant. So let's continue tonight with Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 14. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Well, I don't know how long it's been since we've discussed this, but a covenant in the ancient world was often a lopsided agreement. And so a king, for example, would conquer a, a neighboring kingdom and would offer terms of peace. He'd offer this covenant agreement. You can keep your land, but you will pay me taxes. And in exchange, I won't kill every single one of you. And so it was a lopsided agreement. It was not an agreement between two friends who just decided on a sale price to buy somebody's lawnmower. That, not that kind of thing. But the power in these ancient covenants was almost exclusively on one side. And that is absolutely what we see going on here in God's agreement with Abraham. God is the one who does the commanding. Uh, Abraham is in no position to make demands of God Almighty. So Abraham is the one who does the obeying. God is the one who sets the terms. And it's up to Abraham as to whether he accepts those terms. Uh, and in this passage, God sets circumcision as a sign of the covenant. And just a few observations on this, beginning with the why. You know, what in the world is this about? Why this and not something else? And ultimately, we don't know why God chooses this as a sign of the covenant and not some other 
uh, procedure or thing that they might do or offering they might make or, or something else entirely. As I was preparing for this last Sunday's lesson on being pure in heart, though, one author made an interesting observation. One of God's big rules will be that his people are not to intermarry or have relations with the locals. And this author suggested that circumcision would be a constant reminder of this. And so as a man was in the process of making this decision along these lines, he would look down and he would remember, oh yeah, I am not supposed to do this. I am different from everybody around here. And this is a sign that I belong to God and that I am to obey his commandments. And I never thought about that before, but it did make sense. And that was given as at least one possibility. Of course, this week we looked at uh, uh, Jesus' blessing on the pure in heart. So that's why that came up in that discussion there. But I thought that was an interesting interpretation or at least possibility here. Uh, some have suggested some health reasons. Uh, keeping God's people healthy as possible in the wilderness. Um, but a lot of this perhaps has gone the way of the restrictions on eating pork and catfish. You know, we may think we know the why, but actually we're not told the why. Actually, we're just speculating on a lot of this. So ultimately, God does not explain the reasoning behind this. And it might just be a test of faith. You know, do you love me enough to obey me in this way? The other observation here is that this procedure is to be done on the eighth day after the child is born. And I've seen some studies suggesting that this is when the healing would be faster than at any other point. You know, certain uh, things in the blood stream are up to a certain percentage or whatever where the healing would be maximized on the eighth day as opposed to the third day or the second week or whatever. But again, God doesn't explain any of that here. He just gives the command. This is what I want you to do. And we should also note that this is for everybody, isn't it? All the males, God's people especially, but also any servants who may live with them, anybody who would be associated with one of their households. And the penalty is that anyone who does not obey this will be cut off, which is an interesting irony, isn't it? That person will be cut off from his people. So let's continue with Genesis 17, verses 15 through 21. Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 through 21. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a man one hundred years old? And will Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. In verse 15, we find that God changes Sarai's name as well from Sarai to Sarah. And again, I'm thankful I can call her Sarah from here on out. As I understand it, Sarai means my princess. But Sarah simply means princess. In other words, it seems that Sarah has now been promoted, hasn't she? She's no longer just Abraham's princess, but she is now a princess to the whole world. She is now a princess of over everyone. And this is what God explains in verse 19, as he explains that Sarah will be a mother of nations, and that just like Abraham, kings of peoples will come from her. At this point, however, Abraham falls on his face and straight up laughs out loud at God. You know, God has promised this all along, but Abraham realizes that if this is true, if this is really going to come true in the way God explains here, he's going to be a hundred years old when this child is born. And Sarah herself is now 90. And so to Abraham, this is impossible. This doesn't happen. 
And so he once again proposes a solution of his own, doesn't he? Yet again, he's suggesting a workaround. You know, basically, dear God, let's just use Ishmael. Since this can't happen, just consider Ishmael, my son, and let's just go with him. After all, they already have Ishmael, and Ishmael is already 13 years old at this point. However, notice that God is very specific. No, Sarah will bear a son. And then God explains that they are to name this kid Isaac. Isaac will be the promised child, the child of the covenant. But again, as we learned in the previous chapter, Ishmael will also be blessed. He will not be forgotten. God will remember him. Ishmael will become the father of a great nation as well. The original covenant, though, will be fulfilled not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. And then at the very end, we find that this will happen at this time next year. So the time frame is outlined. It's not just at some point in the future. This will happen within the next year. Well, let's conclude tonight with Genesis 17, verses 22 through 27. Genesis 17, 22 through 27. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all the servants who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day as God had said to him. Now Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the very same day Abraham was circumcised, and Ishmael his son. All the men of his household who were born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. Well, first of all, I would just note that Abraham does not argue with God anymore in this chapter, does he? When God makes the promise in the previous paragraph, Abraham laughs. But when God is firm and very specific in his response, Abraham gets to work. He and his household are circumcised immediately. So as soon as God finished talking with him, in the very same day, the Bible says, just as God had instructed him to do. He didn't delay, but he did that right away. As we close, I think we need to at least mention that circumcision is no longer required as a religious ritual under the New Covenant. In fact, that was one of the big controversies in the early church. If you've read the book of Acts, uh, you are familiar with this. A number of Jewish leaders were demanding that new converts be circumcised, that they basically become Jews before they obey the gospel, before they're baptized into the church. And you may remember the church nearly split over this. There, there was a big deal when Cornelius was baptized and then... Paul brings this news back and everything just blows to pieces. They, they are just concerned is not even uh, the, the way to describe that. Irate, the Gentiles seem to have been allowed into the kingdom and they just had to deal with that. But you may remember they get together in Jerusalem, they discuss this, they talk it out, they call on God basically in that chapter. This is by the Spirit's guidance in Acts 15. And they come together in their understanding that circumcision is not necessary. And then, of course, Paul will go on to mention this in several of his letters. But it's just interesting. Now we finally, we're back to the background of this. We're back to where uh, this all started. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We've come to the end of our study. So uh, we'll pick up in chapter 18 in a few weeks. I'm looking forward to chapter 18. It's a very famous chapter. It's been referred to in our Sunday morning class over the past several weeks. Uh, but I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. We're getting back to our study of Isaiah. And then after class on Sunday, we also plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly as we continue with the seventh of the eight Beatitudes. And then after worship, Lord willing, I plan on heading out toward Colorado for the Bear Valley Bible Lectures. That'll be the first week that I'm gone. And then I hope to head from there uh, to take, uh, I guess I'd call it the scenic route from Denver back to Madison via Port Angeles, Washington, a little bit out of the way. Oh, but that'll be the second week that I'll be gone. So I plan on being gone for about two and a half weeks. And I plan on preaching in Port Angeles, Washington on September 25th uh, before heading back to Wisconsin, hoping to stop through Glacier National Park along the way for a night or two of uh, camping. And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm just saying that starts this Sunday right after worship. Uh, Gary Mueller and Hans Jensen, they will be preaching while I am gone. I wish I could be here to hear them, but I hope to catch them on the internet. And then we plan on having guest speakers on video for the next three Wednesday classes. So I'm just saying the voice you hear one week from tonight will hopefully not be mine. Uh, that link will go out through Facebook and the live stream and member list on our church website. 
Uh, unfortunately, we will most likely not be able to send out the link to those of you who do who uh, subscribe on the YouTube account. So if your only way of connecting us uh, with us is by the notifications that come straight from YouTube, um, we are not uploading those videos to YouTube. We are sending links to videos for, to, from other places and other YouTube channels. So I'm just saying, um, if you only get this notification through YouTube itself, uh, you may want to um, have your email address added to the live stream list. Uh, but let me know if I can help with this. If you need uh, any any help there, let me know, and I'd be uh, willing to find somebody who could uh, give you the help that you need. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord God Almighty, once again we've seen tonight that you are an almighty God who makes and keeps his promises. And tonight we're so thankful for your promise of salvation, a promise made to all people who hear and obey the gospel. Tonight we pray for faith like that of Abraham. There were times when he struggled to believe as we do, but he ultimately obeyed. And we pray that we would trust and obey as well. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus we pray. Amen.